What is a steward? A steward is the local union's representative for a particular bargaining unit at the worksite. One not only represents the interests and rights of members, but also of the union as an organization. The steward is a link between union officers, bargaining unit members, and management representatives. The union steward's main purpose is to protect and strengthen the union. This is accomplished through enforcing workers' rights and building union solidarity. To get any job done, you need the right tools. As a steward, you will need some basic tools, as you develop your skills and gain experience. In your steward's toolbox you should at least have the following items. A contract, this document contains the terms and conditions of employment for bargaining unit members. Those terms and conditions include, but are not limited to the wages, hours of work, leave time. The contract, will contain a majority of the terms, and conditions of employment. Grievance Forms. During this course, you will learn how to fill in the SPFPA grievance form, and the proper language to use. A Notebook. Keeping good notes is essential to processing a grievance. A Grievance Folder. You must keep all your information surrounding a grievance organized. Patience. This is more of skill than a tool. However, remember, you are dealing with your union brother or sister, who has been disciplined, believes their rights have been violated, or has been terminated. Emotions will run high, and they are looking to you for help. You need to have a copy of your department's standard operating procedures. Employers tend to administer discipline to the letter of the rule, or stretch it to fit their allegation. The SOPs or work rules, get to know them, so you can ensure that management applies them fairly, and equitably. Your rights as a steward. When facing management in your role as a union steward, remember, you are their equal. Equality, you have protected legal status. This means you can confront issues head-on, and speak directly to management about the problems, that you see in the workplace. But don't forget, that this excludes outrageous or indefensible behavior, such as violence, or threats of violence, extreme profanity, or slurs. Management, may tend to exaggerate your behavior in the retelling of a situation. So it's always a good idea, to bring another member or a fellow union representative to grievance sessions, or other meetings with management. Remember, you are not protected when you are acting in your individual capacity as a worker. This is an important distinction. Being a steward doesn't give you license to be insubordinate, on work time. No discrimination. Your employer does not have the right, to discriminate against you because of your union involvement. If you see a pattern of unequal or unfair treatment directed at you by management, you need to keep a record of it. If you feel this is happening, talk to your chief steward, or local president. For further assistance, you can contact your regional leadership. As a local steward, you must help educate members. One of the most important things a member should know is how to activate their rights, to have a steward present at a meeting with management. A meeting where they reasonably believe they will be disciplined. Weingarten writes. Under federal and state law, you have the right to union representation when you are called in for disciplinary interview. To get union representation, however, you must have a reasonable belief that you will be disciplined as a result of the interview, and you must request that a union representative be present. You are also entitled to know what the meeting is about, and you are entitled to consult with your union representative before the meeting begins. If you are called in for an interview, read the statement on the back of the SPFPA Weingarten rights, pocket card allowed to your supervisor. I have reason to believe that this investigatory interview may lead to disciplinary action against me, therefore, in accordance with my rights under federal and state statutes. I respectfully request that this interview not begin until 1. My union representative is present. 2. I am advised of the subject and purpose of the interview, and 3. I have had the opportunity to consult with my union representative. All grievances are gripes, but not all gripes are grievances. An important part of your job as a steward, 
is to know the difference when members bring their issues and concerns to you. Some examples of a gripe are 1. Disputes between workers 2. Personality clashes 3. Management rights 4. Complaint, non-contractual Remember you are a leader. So take the time to explain to the member why their issue is not a valid grievance. Express your genuine concern and willingness to help them resolve their problem. What is a grievance? What types of violations could occur that might constitute a legitimate grievance? Contract. Health and safety. Federal and state law. Unfair work rules. Past practice. Before we learn how to write a grievance, let's get familiar with the SPFPA grievance form. The top section requires the following information. 1. Your local number. 2. The name of the company. 3. The unit, i.e. casino, court, correction, FPO, SPO, etc. 4. The grievance number. This number is assigned by the local, using a grievance logbook. One example, is the actual number of the grievance, joined together with the year. Let's say, this is the first local grievance filed in the year 2020, then the grievance number, would be 01-20. Remember keep good records. 5. The date the grievance is written. 6. The grievance shift. 7. The contract provision, that gives the local union the authority, to file a grievance. 8. Your local number. Let's now, take a look at the middle portion of the grievance form. Section 1 is titled, Basis for Grievance, in this area the writer states, the facts surrounding the reason, for the local union's grievance. Section 2 is titled, Contract Provision Violated, in this area the writer states, the contract violations that, the local union alleges were committed by the company. Section 3 is titled, Relief Requested, here's where writer states, the settlement being sought, by the local union. The sections on the bottom of the grievance form, are numbered 1 through 6. In sections 1 through 3, the writer fills in the first step information. The first step, also known as the verbal step should include the names and titles of the union representative, the company representative, and the date the issue was discussed with the company. Sections 4 through 6 are filled in when a written grievance is submitted to management. That should include the names and signatures of the grievant, the union representative, and the manager, along with the date that each person signed the grievance. We will cover the grievance steps later in the presentation. Once the grievance is submitted, it will be presented and discussed through the steps as stated in the contract. On the back of the grievance form, there are sections that the union uses, to record the details of the outcome of each grievance step. You should always get the signature of the management representative who heard the grievance at each step. It's important to maintain the time limits of each step as stated in the contract. Time extensions should always be in writing, and agreed to by the company, and the union. We will be using page 14, in the SPFPA handbook, and guide for handling grievances, as a reference to practice writing a proper, and effective grievance. Please note. This handbook not only covers grievances, but contains other useful information, that all local union representatives should know. Ask your local president to contact the international, to get copies for your local. Let's write a discharge grievance. First, fill out the top of the grievance as previously instructed. Next, the basis or facts for grievance. On or about May 28, 2004, the employer slash company discharged security officer John Jones for allegedly sleeping on duty. The grievant denies that he was sleeping on duty or otherwise, in violation of any company rule or policy. The discharge was without just cause. Let's take a closer look at the language, used in this part of the grievance. You should always start with the phrase, on or about, and then the date. This phrase refers to a date or place used in a grievance, if there is any uncertainty at all in order to protect the person making the allegations of fact, from being challenged as being inaccurate. Always use the word allegedly, when describing why the employer took action, against the grievant. In the next sentence, you must use, the grievant denies, doing whatever the employer said happened. In the same sentence, Use the catch-all phrase, or otherwise in violation of any company rule or policy. This protects the grievant, 
if the employer tries to add any other alleged violations. You always end with, the discharge, or action taken, was without just cause. The second part of the middle section of the grievance is, contract provisions violated. Using the example shown in the handbook on page 14, your narrative should be, by the above, and other acts, the employer slash company has violated Article 5, Section 1, Article 9, Section 5, and other provisions of the agreement, and established past practice. Let's take a closer look at the language used in this part of the grievance. In the narrative, you list all the articles of the contract, you believe have been allegedly violated by the employer or company. You always use the following catch-all phrases. By the above, and other acts, and other provisions of the agreement. Established past practice. The above phrases are non-restricted, and keeps the union's allegations open-ended. Because during your investigation of the grievance, you may find other violations the employer or company allegedly committed. The last part of the middle section of the grievance, is relief requested. The example narrative reads. The union demands that John Jones be reinstated to active employment immediately, without loss of seniority, and that he be made whole, for all loss of wages, and other benefits. Any, and all references to this matter must be removed, from the grievance personnel record. Let's take a closer look at the language used in this part of the grievance. Still working with the handbook on page 14. The narrative shown is self-explanatory. However, some union representatives like to use the catch-all phrase, that the grievant be made whole in every way. Using this language, keeps the union representative from leaving something out of the relief requested, that would benefit the grievant. Remember, once the grievance is settled and signed, it's too late to ask for additional items, to be included in the settlement. If the employer asked for you to be specific, take your time, and be sure to list everything, the grievant lost while discharged. In addition, some employers may see the use of the word demands as hostile, and it could impede the spirit of cooperation. As an alternative, the word request can be used. Earlier in this presentation, we briefly covered the first step section at the bottom of the SPFPA grievance form. Let's take a closer look at some typical, first step contract language. Step 1, Oral Notice to Issuing Shift Manager The security associate, must discuss the grievance with the issuing shift manager. With the aid of his or her steward if he or she desires, no later than five calendar days, after the security associate has knowledge of the event giving rise to the grievance. The issuing shift manager shall orally respond to the security associate, no later than five calendar days thereafter. The question you may be asking yourself, if the first step is a verbal or informal step, then why is there space to record the first step information on our grievance form? The answer is good record keeping. Even if the grievance was discussed and settled verbally, you should write down, who the union met with, and what was management's answer. You may need this information in future dealings with management. In addition, there are contracts that the first step is a formal step, and a written grievance is necessary. You should always recommend to your members, that it's good practice to have a steward with them, anytime they discuss a grievance with management. It's important that you let management know that they cannot settle grievances with individuals without the union's knowledge and approval. This is to safeguard the integrity of the contract. Remember, when you turn in a grievance, be sure to submit the original to the company and retain a copy for the union. Now let's discuss grievance preparation. Investigation, interviews, and using a steward checklist to ensure you are ready for the grievance step meetings. Checklist for handling employee complaints. Prerequisites. Know the contract. Make sure that meetings with employees to handle complaints are held in accordance with any contract. Provision that regulate the time and or location for such meetings. Develop good listening and note-taking skills. Be prepared to spend the time to get the evidence and testimony to support your case and to refute management's case. Treat all employees fairly, and consistently. Keep good records of all transactions, oral and written, that occur from the time a complaint is brought to you, until the case is resolved through a grievance or an arbitration. Know who, when and how to ask for help. Interview the grievant. Let the grievant tell his or her story without interruption. Take notes. 
review the grievance description of the case with him or her, to make sure you have all the facts. Make sure you get the answers to the questions who, what, when, where, why and how. Ask the grievant for the names, addresses, and telephone numbers of any witnesses. Ask the grievant to tell you what he or she thinks each witness knows about the case. Record this information, try to clarify any uncertainties about what a witness is supposed to know. Ask the grievant to give you all of the evidence he or she has concerning the case. Make copies so that no information is lost. Before the grievant leaves, check one more time to make sure you have all the facts, names of witnesses, and evidence. View witnesses. Does the witness have direct personal knowledge about what happened or is his or her knowledge based only on hearsay? Is the witness credible and able to give a reasonable explanation about the events and an honest, accurate accounting even if this means revealing negative things about his or her record or conduct? Does the witness statement confirm what the grievant has said or are there differences or inconsistencies? Does the witness have any reason to be less than truthful in stating what he or she knows about the case? Verify name, address, telephone number, work shift, and location of all witnesses. Make certain witnesses sign, and date all statements. Using the seven tests. To determine if the company had just cause, to take disciplinary action against a worker. Our main contractual weapon is often times summed up in one short sentence. Employees shall be disciplined or discharged only for just cause. The importance of a sentence like this, is that it binds the employer to imposing discipline, not just for any reason, cause, but the reason has to be a just reason. What is a just cause standard? It is commonly accepted, that there are seven tests as to whether a boss has used just cause, in handing out discipline. The Bureau of National Affairs, lists them as follows. 1. Was the employee adequately warned, of the consequences of his conduct? The warning may be given orally or in printed form. An exception may be made, for certain conduct, such as insubordination, coming to work drunk, drinking on the job, or stealing employer property, that is so serious that the employee, is expected to know it will be punishable. Example, if an employee is told to stop using vulgar language, and told that if he continues he will be disciplined, that may be adequate warning. However if a boss comes up to an employee and says, I'm tired of your swearing, cut it out, and then the next day, fires the employee for swearing again, that may not be adequate warning. 2. Was the employer's rule, or order reasonably related to efficient, and safe operations? Example, a boss makes a rule, that all employees must wear red t-shirts, and they must be tucked in so they don't get caught in machinery. An employee is fired, for wearing a blue t-shirt that was tucked in. Making a rule that t-shirts must be tucked in, so they won't get caught in machinery, may be reasonable, and related to safety, but demanding the t-shirt be blue, isn't related to safety or efficiency. 3. Did management investigate before administering the discipline? The investigation normally should be made before the decision to discipline is made. Where immediate action is required, however, the best course is to suspend the employee, pending investigation with the understanding, that he will be restored to his job, and paid for time lost if he is found not guilty. Example, the boss fires a worker for stealing, and then demands evidence from the union that the worker isn't guilty. At the grievance meeting, the boss admits he never investigated the incident, just took another employee's word. This probably wouldn't hold up. If the union has facts, to prove the employee's innocence, they should be presented to the boss, even though he failed, to properly investigate the case. 4. Was the investigation fair and objective? Example, if an incident happened, does the employer interview everyone present, or only management people who were present? If the employer refuses, to interview non-management workers, then the investigation may not be fair. 5. Did the investigation produce substantial evidence or proof of guilt? It is not required, that the evidence be preponderant, conclusive, or beyond reasonable doubt, except where the alleged misconduct is of such a criminal or reprehensible nature, as to stigmatize the employee, and seriously impair his chances for future employment. 6. Were the rules, orders, and penalties applied even-handedly, and without discrimination? If enforcement has been lax in the past, 
management cannot suddenly reverse its course and begin to crack down without first warning employees of its intent. Example, this is the most common form of discrimination. An employer decides to suspend Mary for taking too long at lunch, but lets the employees who eat lunch with a supervisor take extra time every day. This would not hold up. However, if the employer tells everyone that starting on Monday, employees will be disciplined for taking too long at lunch, and on Tuesday Mary comes back late, and everyone else has been on time, she may be disciplined. Was the penalty reasonably related to the seriousness of the offense and the past record? If employee A's past record is significantly better than that of employee B, the employer properly may give employee A lighter punishment than employee B for the same offense. Example, the classic example is two employees get in an argument and shove each other. One has 25 years service with a clean record. The other has three years service with lots of warnings and discipline. Based upon the worker's seniority and records, the employer may give the older worker less punishment than the other worker. You filed a good grievance, but the work needed to be done to win it has just begun. How you present your grievance can mean the difference between winning or losing. The timing and kind of grievance meeting you have will depend on your contract. The contract also determines who in management you will be dealing with. But the skills used around presenting grievances are universal. Grievance meetings. 1. Set ground rules. Union ground rules. A good steward or business agent should agree to some ground rules. A common one is, never contradict what another union person says, or agree to a management proposal without stopping for a caucus, a private meeting among just the union people. Ground rules for the meeting. The union has the right to bargain over how the meeting is conducted, where it takes place, and other details. This is important if management is trying to gang up on a member or otherwise set the tone for the meeting. 2. Ask questions and get information. Part of your job in a hearing is to find out what management is up to and what their arguments are. This is especially important with grievances that may end up at the panel or in arbitration. 3. Get agreements in writing. You may not do this for every little grievance, but definitely do it with discipline cases and contract interpretation issues. If management refuses to sign off on an agreement, write your own understanding of the terms and give or send it to them. 4. Take control. Your goal should be to control the tone, direction, and outcome of a grievance meeting. Here are some basic suggestions. Ask questions. One strategy is to get management talking and keep them talking. Force them to explain actions, and take note of lies or discrepancies. Take your time. Set the pace. Management likely considers grievance meetings a waste of time. Take the time needed to address everything. Don't get angry, being aggressive, and firm is good. But do not let management make you lose control, when you don't want to. Take notes. Someone should be prepared to take written notes. Initial meetings are often used to find out where management stands, what evidence they have, and so on. Write down key management statements. After the meeting, take a minute to jot down anything you may have missed. Make a note of the date and time and who was present. Here's some more grievance presentation points. Prepare the case in advance. Prior to the grievance hearing, the union representative should have already interviewed the grievance and witnesses, checked the employee's file, gathered all relevant facts, reviewed applicable contract articles, formulated arguments, and prepared written notes, and anticipated management's arguments. Preparation leads to a confident presentation. Equal status with management. As a union representative in a grievance hearing, you have equal standing with management. Insist on being treated as such. Stick to the facts, stay focused, avoid bluffing. Define the union's position in clear terms, and with specific facts. Do not get sidetracked. Stay focused on resolving the grievance. Act professional, and disagree with dignity. Do not get personal or hostile. It is best to disagree firmly, and clearly. Take notes. It is critical that good notes, are taken as your record of the hearing. Listen, and observe body language. Let management make its case without interruption. 
the burden of proof is on management in disciplinary cases. Ask questions. Always ask questions for clarification and understanding of what management is saying, as well as when you want management's position committed for the record. Questions also can break up management's attempts to lecture the union. Avoid arguments or disagreements among union members. Once in the meeting, the union must maintain a united front. If there are internal disagreements, or if the grievance story changes, take a break. Always maintain control. Management face savers. The grievance may be one that management wants to settle, but does not want to appear, as caving into the union. Be aware of such signals, and attempt a solution that is good for all. This is a long-term relationship. Creative solutions. Try and explore, creative ways to resolve the grievance, especially at the lowest level of the process. However, guard against any remedies, that would violate or undercut the contract, or set bad precedent. Learn the facts. One way to make sure you have all the information you need, is to use the five W's. Who is involved? What was said or done? When did it happen? Where did it happen? And why did it happen? What is the underlying cause? The union, through certification or recognition, is established as the exclusive bargaining representative, for all employees in the bargaining unit. The union must fairly represent all employees in the unit. The legal term for this is the duty of fair representation. The most important area in carrying out a union's duty of fair representation, is the processing of grievances. Most failure to represent charges, brought against unions are filed by persons who have been discharged. Therefore, union representatives, need to be particularly careful in handling discharge grievances. The following guidelines will assist you in processing grievances, in a way that meets the union's legal responsibility. Consider all grievances solely on their merits. The decision whether or not to process a grievance, must be based on the merits of the particular grievance. This means that you must look at the facts, underlying the grievance in determining whether a grievance has occurred, and if so, whether to pursue the grievance through the grievance procedure. You may not refuse to process a grievance because you do not like the grievance. Your determination whether there is a legitimate grievance, may not be based on personal hostility, you think the employee is a pain in the neck, political opposition, the employee ran against you in the last election, or discrimination of any kind. You must look at the merits of the particular grievance, not at the individual employee. Process the grievance promptly, and do not miss time limits for filing, and appealing grievances. Timeliness is extremely important, in grievance processing. You have a responsibility, to file and appeal grievances within the time limits, established by the grievance procedure in your contract. Failure to comply with the time limits, can result in having the grievance die, leaving the grievance, with no recourse against the employer. If additional time is needed to investigate, file the grievance so as not to miss the time limits. An investigation does not have to be completed before a grievance is filed. The grievance informed. Many charges are filed, against unions because discharged grievance, believe the union is hiding something, by not keeping the grievance, advised of the progress of his or her grievance. The grievance should be kept informed, of the status of his or her grievance, where it is in the grievance process, and any management responses. Any union decision on the grievance, should immediately be communicated to the grievance, preferably in writing. This includes decisions not to file a grievance, to drop, withdraw or settle a grievance, or not to go to arbitration on a grievance. Getting information. Having good, and complete information is vital in fighting grievances. But where and how do we get it? First we should look to ourselves. An informed steward not only knows the contract, but the past practices of the department. A wealth of knowledge exists among the members as well. And of course the local union should keep records. But sometimes, that still isn't enough to be properly prepared. Help can come from an unexpected source, the employer. It's not because they want to provide information. 
the union is entitled to it, under the National Labor Relations Act, NLRA. Information and the Law The National Labor Relations Act was passed in 1935, since then, anti-labor amendments and court decisions have greatly weakened the NLRA. Nevertheless, the law still requires employers to provide information to the union that the employer has or can reasonably obtain, provided that the information requested is relevant or useful to the union in bargaining. Bargaining includes not only contract negotiations, but applies to grievances as well. Employers refusing to supply such information may be subject to unfair labor practice complaints. Information and the law. The steward may request information before a grievance is filed to see if the contract may have been violated at or between any step of the grievance procedure after the final step to prepare for or consider a possible arbitration case. It's best to be specific about what we want and unless the information is immediately available to put the request in writing. Remember, the information must bear some relevance to the actual or potential grievance. The union is not allowed to use requests merely to conduct a fishing expedition through company records. Nevertheless all sorts of company documents data and factual information are fair game. The best way to request information from your employer is by submitting an information form. Locals can easily create an information request form. Let's go over what needs to be on the form, starting with the upper section. The form header could be the SPFPA logo with the title, SPFPA, your local number, grievance information request. Next provide a space for the name of the employer, then to the right a space for the date. Open with a greeting to the employer's representative, you are presenting the form to. Continue the narrative with the following statement. On the behalf of SPFPA, your local number, and pursuant to Section 8A, 5, of the National Labor Relations Act, as amended, the union hereby requests the following information. Next you need to number each piece of information you are requesting. Example, 1. All attendance records, of Officer John Jones. Continue your list as necessary. On the lower section of the form you need to include the following. The reason why you are requesting the information. Example, the foregoing information is necessary, and relevant for the union to process grievance number 01-20. Information can also be requested for other reasons. A couple of examples are, to prepare for collective bargaining, or to prepare for arbitration of grievance number 01-20. Next, you state how many days, the union would like the employer, to deliver the requested information. An example would be, please provide the information within 5 days of this request. Next, you keep the union options open to request more information with this statement. This request is not intended to be inclusive, and the union expressly reserves the right to request additional information, as necessary, and appropriate under the circumstances. End the narrative with the following statement. If there is any questions, please contact me at this phone number, and or this email. You finish the form with a complimentary closing, along with your signature, printed name, and your local union title. The National Labor Relations Act, NLRA, created the National Labor Relations Board, NLRB. Union membership reached 35% of the workforce. Industrialists, and other business opponents sought to weaken the act. They succeeded in 1947, with the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act. In 1959, Congress imposed further restrictions on unions in the Landrum-Griffin Act, designed for the reporting, and disclosure of certain financial transactions of labor organizations. Three most important sections of the NLRA are Sections, 7, 8, and 9. Section 7 is the heart of the NLRA. It defines protected activity. Employees shall have the right, to self-organization, to form, join, or assist labor organizations, to bargain collectively through representatives of their own choosing, and to engage in other concerted activities for the purpose of collective bargaining or other mutual aid, and protection. Section 7 protects union activity. In addition to organizing, it protects workers who take part in grievances, on-the-job protests, picketing, and strikes. Section 8 defines employer and union unfair labor practices. Five types of employer conduct are made illegal. Employer interference, restraint, 
or coercion directed against union activity, Section 8A, 1. Employer domination of unions, Section 8A, 2. Employer discrimination against employees, who take part in union activities, Section 8A, 3. Employer retaliation for filing unfair labor practice charges, or cooperating with the NLRB, Section 9A, 4. Employer refusal to bargain in good faith, with union representatives, Section 8A, 5. Section 8, also prohibits union unfair labor practices, including failure to provide fair representation, to all members of the bargaining unit. Section 9 provides that unions, if certified or recognized, are the exclusive representatives of bargaining unit members. It prohibits the adjustment of employee grievances unless a union representative is given an opportunity to be present. It also sets out union selection procedures. Successful habits of an effective steward. Know where to get answers. When you are not sure of the answer to a question asked, it is better to take the time to get the correct answer than to give out wrong information. Refer to your local leaders, and for further assistance contact your regional leadership. Learn to delegate. You are not expected to do everything by yourself. Get more people involved, more will be accomplished. Learn how to empower people. You are not expected to solve every problem. Help people help themselves. Ask questions. The more information you have, the better prepared you are to assist your co-workers and colleagues. Don't get treated less than an equal. As a steward, you are on equal terms with management. You can be an expert. Your knowledge of the frontline experience will enable you to work closely with management on workplace issues. Pick your battles. Take a stand on workplace issues, you know you can defend. Always get back to people. Follow through on your commitments, and avoid promises you know you cannot keep. Be organized. Keep track of appointments, meetings, and notes so you can find things quickly. Be an example. Being a responsible employee fosters respect. Keep a sense of humor. A positive attitude is a powerful tool. Keep your goals in sight. Even if there are setbacks, the best way to change things for the better, is through collective action. Help everyone support the union. You will make mistakes. Learning from your mistakes, will make you a better union representative in the long run. A strong, active union in the workplace, where workers pull together to make a real difference, is the only way we can improve the lives of SPFPA members. Your job as steward, is to make sure your union is strong, and that's why it's the most challenging, most rewarding, and most important job in our union. Thank you. There's nothing that can stop us in this organization. Absolutely nothing.